Okay. So I, I'll start again. Our next speaker is Dimitri Vertsekas. He got a bachelor's degree both in electrical and mechanical engineering for the, from the National Technical University of Athens, then a master's degree in electrical engineering from George Washington University, and later on a PhD in system science from the MIT. He was, uh, he taught at Stanford University, later on at the University of Illinois at Urbana, and since 1979, he has been in MIT in the computer science department, where he's currently McAfee Professor of Engineering. Well, he has uh, written many books, in fact, something like 13 books, seven of which, as far as I know, were just by himself, the remaining six with co authors. And some of these books, particularly, I guess, the nonlinear programming one, has become like a standard textbook in many, many places, including in our courses here in IMPA. He's also the author of something like more than 130 papers and a lot of technical reports and things like that. And he's certainly one of the leading uh, researchers in nonlinear optimization. So uh, I, I would like to invite him to give his talk today. <coughs> Myself, Alfredo. It's my pleasure to be here. <laughs> well, about two, two and a half years ago, I decided to teach a course on convex analysis and optimization at MIT. My objective was to try to make the subject accessible to a broad range of students, sophisticated students, but not necessarily mathematicians. I had tried to do the same thing many years ago, 30 years ago, uh, using the leading textbook uh, of the day, and it turned out to be not a very successful undertaking. The reason is that convex analysis is a geometrical, highly intuitive subject, but it's also mathematical, and uh, the students need to have uh, an understanding of what are the main ideas. And at that time, I could not give them the unifying threads of the subject in a way that they could understand. So I decided I had to take a new look at the subject, try to find the important theorems and the important structures that students could understand. And uh, in the process of doing so, uh, I had to do some research and some restructuring of the field. And uh, the, what I'd like to talk about today is, are, are the main ideas of, uh, of this restructuring and the research that uh, uh, is behind it. My talk is, not go is going to be sort of high level. Uh, I apologize to the mathematicians that this, my statements are not going to be very precise. You're not going to see many formulas. Um, but there's a lot of material on the web on this, and you can find it there. Also, my slides are on the web, and you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can revisit them if you want to. I want to say a few, a few general things about convexity issues in optimization, uh, give you some history of the subject, and then concentrate on three unifying lines of analysis, all of which are more or less new. Um, one is the a common geometrical framework for duality, constrained optimization, duality, and minimax. These two paradigms of constrained optimization, duality, and minimax are going to be central in this talk, so let me write what I mean uh, by this. The main problem if, of constrained optimization I'm going to be looking at is uh, minimizing a function f. Everything is finite dimensional here, uh, subject to a number of inequality constraints and uh, subject to a set constraint. 
Now this is called the primal problem, and there's a dual problem to that. That's the, maximum, the maximum of some dual function that I'm not going to bother writing here. But the key question is how the optimal values of these two problems relate to each other. Ideally, you'd like them to be equal, and you'd like to understand the circumstances under which they are not. So that's the constrained optimization problem. And the minimax problem is one whereby you have a function of two variables, let's say x and z, and you look at the inf soup over x and over z. x and z live in some finite dimensional sets. And the question is whether this is equal to the soup inf. It's a fundamental problem in the theory of zero-sum games. Now, these two problems are related, but the exact relationship, um, but there is no sufficient intersection between them to derive the theory of one from the theory of the other. So the approach that I followed here is to construct a simple geometrical framework from which both problems can be seen as special cases. The second uh, unifying line of analysis has to do with two important issues in constrained optimization. One is the existence of optimal solutions, a very fundamental issue, and the other has to do with existence of a duality gap between the primal and the dual problem. Now these two problems are apparently disconnected, yet they have a common, a common origin, a common root uh, for the corresponding results. And I'd like to bring this out. It has to do with theorems for proving that the intersection of a nested collection of closed sets is non-empty. So it's about theorems of, for, uh, for non-empty intersections. The third line of analysis has to do with Lagrange multiplier theory and conditions for which there, you can, there exists Lagrange multipliers. These are called constraint qualifications. And there are many of those constraint qualifications. And what we've done here is introduce a sort of a super constraint qualification that contains all of those as special cases and provides a theoretical bridge between these constraint qualifications and existence results. This is the notion of pseudo-normality, and it is based on a more powerful enhanced set of Fritz-John necessary conditions. So these are the three subjects I'm going to be concentrating on. But before I do that, let me say a few things about why convexity is so prevalent, so pervasive in optimization. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of this is, uh, is very well known to many of you, so bear with me. What I also want to do is introduce some terminology. The first important thing is that a convex function, a function that has convex epigraph, has no local minima that are not global. Great thing in optimization. The second thing is that if you have a non-convex function such as this, then by taking the convex hull of its epigraph, you can convexify it, and in the process, still maintain the optimality of its minima. A third thing is that a convex set always has a non-empty interior. For example, that's interior relative to the affine hull, the smallest linear set that contains the, uh, the, the convex set. Uh, so for example, a non-convex set, this set has no, has no uh, relative interior point. However, a convex set always has a non-empty interior. And also a convex set has feasible directions, uh, namely that given any point, it is possible to go along some directions from that point to any other point in the set without getting out from the set. That's very important in algorithms, normality conditions, and so on. These are distinguishing features between convex and non-convex sets, which make convex very attractive for optimization. And there are more things. Convex sets have a very important property with regard to directions of unboundedness. Given a convex set such as this, if you take a point and take a direction along which the set goes unbounded, then that same direction is a direction of unbounded for any point of the convex set. This is true for closed convex sets. Just the, in other words, a direction of unboundedness does not depend on the starting point, depends only on the set. And this, analogy, and this fact carries through for convex functions. If you have a convex function, if you look at the level sets of the function, 
then all of these level sets have the same directions of unboundedness. And therefore, you can characterize, uh, you can talk about directions of unboundedness or directions of recession of a convex function. And these directions of recession are directions along which the function goes downhill without ever coming back uphill. So this is very important in showing in results involving, uh, relating to existence of solutions. For example, if you have a minimize a convex function of our convex set, there is an optimal solution if there is no direction of recession that's common to the convex, to the constraint set and the convex function. Another very well-known thing, a polyhedral convex set is characterized by a finite number of extreme points in extreme directions like this, very important in the simplex method and linear programming. A real value convex function is continuous everywhere and also has nice differentiability properties. It's not necessarily differentiable, it may have corners, but there's a nice substitute for the gradient, namely subgradients, which are hyperplanes that support the graph of the function from below. And these subgradients enter in optimality conditions, they are the basis for computational methods, and uh, they play an important role in the subject. In duality, convex functions figure very prominently. Furthermore, there's a notion of uh, self-duality for convex functions. If you have a convex function like this red function here, and you take a hyperplane that's non-vertical and it's pointing upwards, and look at the support and, and move this hyperplane so that it supports the graph of the function, it has a level of interception. So you can associate hyperplane normals with level of interception, and that gives you a function, the so-called conjugate convex function of the original. And it turns out that if you conjugate the conjugate, you get back the original, provided the original is convex and lower semi-continuous. Now, here's an important duality principle. Take a convex function, this red function, and look at hyperplanes with a given normal that uh, support and cut at a certain point. And let's take a concave function and do the same thing but support from above. Then you have this difference between the level of interception. And if you look at the difference between the function values at various points, you'll always find that the vertical difference is larger than the interception level difference. But if you move this hyperplane around properly, then you can get equality between the two normally. So you have the infimum of the function value difference is equal except in, in as a, is generically equal, but with some exceptions, to the supremum of the interception value, interception level difference. This is called Fenchers duality theorem, and it's fundamental in optimization, and it's possible thanks to convexity. Okay, some history of the subject. The, of course, it stems, it comes from geometry, and uh, it took uh, some character of its own with the work of Kara Theodori, the famous Kara Theodori theorem for convex hulls. Uh, the work on Minkowski and Farkas on, uh, on, on polyhedral convexity, the work on Steinitz on relative interiors and uh, relative interiors and the recession, recession directions. And then it went on for a while, but it, big, a bi it took a big boost and it turned towards the direction of optimization with the work of von Neumann on game theory, on duality, linear programming duality and later nonlinear programming duality by Kuhn and Tucker and Fenchel, the problem I mentioned earlier. And I think that the general agreement that the modern foundation of the subject of convexity and optimization lies with a very remarkable set of notes by Fenchel, 1951. He gave a set of lectures at Princeton University. They were never published as a book, but they circulated widely as mimeographed uh, notes. And uh, Fenchel introduced all the basic ideas of modern convex analysis, so the theory of subgradients, the theory of conjugate, function, conjugate convex functions, the theory 
of uh, his duality theory, all of this is in just 150 pages. All the fundamental ideas are there. On the other hand, Rockefeller, uh, Fenchel's work formed, formed the starting point for the work of Rockefeller, who took Fenchel's work to a higher level of rigor and depth. Rockefeller's work, uh, Rockefeller published a book which is considered a classic of convex analysis. It's a very remarkable book. Lots and lots of people have used it. I have used it extensively. I have nothing but great admiration for Rockefeller's work. It's an excellent, uh, excellent work which in some sense dampened further research <coughs> on convex analysis because people thought, well, Rockefeller has done it all. Okay. So the field turned in other directions, particularly towards bridging convex optimization with non-convex optimization and non-smooth analysis. And some of the prominent names here are Clark, Mordekovich, and Rockefeller and West, who published a book on, called Variation Analysis in 19, a few years ago, which is a very important event, an excellent book with a lot of very rich in terms of material and depth. Now, the outgrowth of my work in this area is a book that was published a few months ago with the help of two of my students, Angelia Nedic and Asumanos Daglar. And the aim is to make the subject accessible through unification and geometric visualization. Uh, having said all these good things about Rockefeller's book, I feel freer to criticize it. I think there's general agreement that Rockefeller's book is hard to read. Uh, this is due to, to a lot of material that's not organized uh, very tightly. It's theorems upon theorems upon theorems, and it's very difficult to find out what are the fundamental ideas, even if you look very hard. You can trace the ideas from one theorem to the preceding theorem, the preceding theorem, and so on, and get, go several theorems deep, but still not figure out what are the important ideas until you spend an awful lot of time. This is a very geometrical subject, yet Rockefeller's book does not have a single figure. Uh, it is, it's not designed to be friendly for, for, the, for, the, for the audience. Yet a lot of people have used it because of its depth and quality, but mostly using it as a reference. In other words, quoting theorems without necessarily understanding either the proofs or the ideas behind the proofs. Now, one thing that's lacking from Rockefeller's work is this unification. Uh, the, the, the important ideas are not standing out for people to see. And what we have tried to do is through these lines of analysis that I mentioned earlier to achieve some unification and therefore to make the book more accessible and the subject more accessible to people. So here's my main subject. The first line of analysis is this universe, uni, uh, a unified universe, u, geometrical approach to convex programming duality and minimax theory. Instead of trying to relate directly the two subjects, uh, we start from a simple elementary geometrical framework involving some sets and some hyperplanes, prove theorems on that, on that one figure that I'm going to show you so shortly, uh, and then specialize these theorems to constraint optimization and minimax theory and also Fenchel duality and then the ideas of existence of an optimal dual solution and existence of a duality gap become, become quite simple. The second line is through by answering some basic questions about intersections of nested sequence of closed sets we we bring out a unified view of the theory of existence of optimal solutions and also absence of a duality gap. In other words, we prove a few theorems about intersections and each one of those theorems gives you an existence result and a duality gap result for these two, two uh, problems. The third uh, unified uh, line is, um, is the notion of constrained pseudonormality and um, and its impact and its, uh, and its role as a super constraint qualification that guarantees the existence of Lagrange multipliers. So I'm going to concentrate now on these three issues. 
let me just mention that all of these, um, all of these um, lines of analysis enter into the development of uh, duality theory. From closed set intersection results, we develop results about preservation of closedness under partial minimization. In other words, given a function, capital F, of x and u, of two variables x and u, that's lower semi-continuous, suppose we minimize with respect to one variable. Then we get a function of p of u. Now suppose that f is lower semi-continuous, p is not necessarily lower semi-continuous, but these results on closed set intersections give us results that guarantee the lower semi-continuity of p. Now it turns out that this is a basic question in duality gap analysis. A certain function, if it's lower semi-continuous, that's a guarantee that there's no duality gap. The duality between the elementary geometrical problems, we call this the min common max crossing duality. These two geometric problems are called the min common point problem and max crossing point problem. And this duality theory, and this, this, this duality gives you a nonlinear Farkas lemma, which in turn gives you the provides a theorem on equality of primal and dual inferential duality and also a theorem on existence of solutions and also in the context of constrained optimization uh, duality the existence of dual optimal solutions in geometric multipliers or Lagrange multipliers. The same results on existence of geometric multipliers can be guaranteed through this can be obtained through this enhanced fritz john conditions, which actually give you something more. They tell you not only that there exists a Lagrange multiplier, but there exists a Lagrange multiplier of a special type called informative, which has some special sensitivity properties. And, uh, and um, it turns out that, uh, that uh, it always exists if one of those exists. So, oh, incidentally, Minimax theory is everywhere here in the middle. Uh, it, uh, one can develop it through the min common max crossing theory and the, uh, and the closed set intersection uh, theory. And then one can use it to also derive absence of duality gap in constrained optimization and also potential duality theory. So it can be viewed either by itself or also as an alternative route towards proving constrained optimization results. So that's basically the the framework uh, and the way that um, this analysis line come into play. So let me talk first about these two geometric problems. Okay, suppose that you are in Rn plus one, Rn and R, and you have a set, some set M, okay? Consider now the problem, consider the intersection of the vertical axis with this set and find the minimum point on that intersection. Okay, so this is what we call a primal problem. Consider also hyperplanes that support this set looking, non-vertical hyperplanes that support this set and pointing upwards, and look at the levels of interception of these hyperplanes. Now consider the problem of maximizing the level of interception. Out of all of these hyperplanes, find one where the level of interception is maximized. We call this the max crossing problem. You can define cost functions and constraints for both of these problems, so they are elementary problems, but still legitimate constrained optimization problems. F star is the mean, W star is the mean common point, Q star is the maximum crossing point. And it's very easy to see that we always have Q star less or equal to W star, and this is called weak duality. And the distance between the two is called a duality gap. Now, here's a favorable case where there is no duality gap. What's happening here is if you take this set, the set M, which is shaded here, and you extend it upwards, and you look at this set here, it is convex. In other words, this set M has a convex bottom. 
And that tends to guarantee the equality of the max crossing point with the mean common point. Not only that, but in this figure, you can guarantee that there exists an optimal solution to the max crossing problem. And uh, this optimal solution is guaranteed because the set cuts on both sides of the vertical axis. In other words, the zero point is a relative interior point of the projection of this set on the vertical axis. Now, all of this can be translated into theorems of existence and uh, W star equals Q star and so on. Now, here's an exceptional case where the set M has a convex bottom. Okay, this set is convex, but what's happening, there's a duality gap because this set comes tangentially to the vertical axis and there's a missing segment here of that set. It's still convex, but that segment is missing. And there's a difference between Q star and W star. So this one figure, in my view, tells it all. And if you start from here, then things, you know where you're going. I should say that this figure is not new. Okay? Uh, this kind of construction is uh, implicit in, uh, in a lot of uh, uh, work on uh, duality. Uh, this exact same figure, you can find it in the book on nonlinear programming that I wrote in 99 that Alfredo mentioned. It's not new, but this figure has been used as a vehicle for geometric visualization. What we are, what's different here is that we're using it as a framework for analysis. In other words, it's the starting point for analysis here. And basically what, what, what we do is to prove theorems about the geometry of M Prove conditions on M that guarantee that W star equals Q star. Conditions on M that guarantee existence of a max crossing hyperplane. And then choose in a special ways M to reduce the constrained optimization problem, the minimax problem, the Fenchel duality framework, and a few other related things to view them as special cases of the min common max crossing framework. And then after we have proved these theorems about the geometry of M and their implication, we specialize to get specific theorems on duality and minimax. So what's new here is using this as an analytical framework. We don't get any new results. It's just an easier way of presenting things and understanding them. So let me be a little bit more specific. Here is a constrained optimization problem, inequality constraints and an excess set constraint. The dual problem traditionally has been defined by considering the Lagrangian function involving the inner product of a Lagrange of a multiplier vector mu and uh, the constrained vector minimizing over x that gives you the dual function as a function of mu. And the optimal primal value, the optimal value of this problem is the inf soup of the Lagrangian. It's easy to see that uh, if you take the soup of the Lagrangian, then it's infinity outside the constraint set, and it's equal to f inside the constraint set, so it's very easy to see that this is the open prime value. On the other hand, by definition, this is q of mu, so the optimal dual value is soup m, hence the relationship between constraint optimization, duality, and minimax. Now, Let's consider a perturbed version of this problem, where the right-hand side of zero is replaced by a perturbation vector u. There's a perturbation for each constraint, so u is r-dimensional here. And consider the infimum of this. This is called the primal function. It's very well known in duality analysis. Suppose that you take as m the set in the man mean common max crossing framework, to be the epigraph of P. Then, then what happens is that so this is M here. It's the epigraph of P, and actually you can obtain M in, in other ways as well, in terms of constraint and cost vectors, uh, constraint and cost. Uh, and, um, and this is P here.
and p sub 0 is the optimal primal value, and q star uh, is the uh, optimal dual value, and they turn out to be the mean common and max crossing uh, values. So anything that you prove in the, for the general set framework is specialized to the constraint optimization framework like so. Similar for minimax, a function of x and z, under what conditions do we have sup inf equals inf sup? If you assume convexity and concavity of f of f, convexity with respect to x, concavity with respect to z, and semi-continuity, upper, upper semi-continuity with respect to z, lower semi-continuity with respect to x, and suppose you consider a perturbed inf sup function, where the perturbation is a linear term in u and z, this is a function of uh, u, then it's possible to show that the mean common value for the epigraph of this function is the inf sup, the max crossing value is the sup inf, and inf sup equals sup inf is equivalent to existence to mean common equals max crossing. So in particular, I recall that p sub u is this perturbed inf sub function. And here's the epigraph, and this is the inf sup, and the sup inf is whatever you can get. Inf, actually the, 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 the inf is this, and maximizing it is the, is the max crossing value. In the case where you have a gap between inf, if, uh, inf sup and sup inf is shown here where you have convexity under convexity and concavity on x and z, but there's a, something missing, and that's the difference between inf sup and sup inf. If you have a situation like this, where the set crosses on both sides of the vertical axis, then you can say things about the existence of a maximizing value. Otherwise, even if in a situation like this, you may have no duality gap, but the maximizing value may not be attained. It's a similar figure for potential duality that I'm not going to show here. And um, And now let me go on to the next topic. OK, we have these basic issues of duality gap and uh, uh, imp sup equals sup imp. And the mean common max crossing framework tells us in what direction we should be going. On the other hand, getting specific results, uh, we need to do uh, further analysis. What the mean common max crossing framework sh uh, shows is that whether there exists a duality gap or, or not is an issue of lower semi-continuity. Okay? No gaps in, this, in the epigraph of this function. The, what it also tells us that the question of, um, of existence of an optimal dual solution is a question of existence of a non-vertical support hyperplane at the right point, or subgradient of the, of the primal function p. So now the question is, under what conditions do we get lower semi-continuity, and under what conditions do we get existence of solutions? And that brings us to the second topic. Now what I want to show you is that these two issues can be, analysis of these two, it can be traced to results about intersections of nested families of closed sets. So let's consider these two basic problems. The attainment of a minimum of a function f over a set x and the existence of a duality gap. Now, when does there exist an optimal solution of f over x? Well, if and only if the set of the the intersection of all the non-empty level sets is non-empty. So it's clearly a set intersection issue. Now the question of existence of a duality gap 
relates to lower semi-continuity of this primal function. Remember that in the case of constrained optimization duality, P of u was defined as the inf over x Now you can view this as infimum over x of an extended real valued function of x and u. So under the, what conditions is this lower semi-continuous? Well, I claim that this is also a set intersection issue. And let me look at this more closely. Suppose you have a function of two variables, say x and u. Okay, so the function is like this and you minimize pointwise for each u, you minimize with respect to x. Now what you're going to get is a function that has epigraph that's obtained by collapsing the epigraph of this function and projecting it on this axis here. The only problem is that there are some bottom points that may be missing. So what's happening really is that if you look at the function p that's the infimum over x of this, then the epigraph of P is contained between the projection of the epigraph of F and the closure of the projection. This is a generic result. So, if projection, if, if F is closed, it has a closed epigraph, and projection maintains closedness, that means that P is lower semi-continuous. So the question shifts to whether projection on the space of U preserves closedness of the epigraph of F. And more generally, whether given a closed and convex set C, under what circumstances is the projection uh, closed? No, I'm sorry. There's a more general result here involving linear transformations. You can view linear, the projection as a special case of linear transformation. What I'm going to say applies also to the case of linear transformations. Well, how do you prove closedness? Here's the set C, and you project it down on the space of U, okay? And you want to show that for every convergent sequence within the projection that converges, let's say, to Y bar, the limit Y bar comes down by projecting some point in, in C. So, look at a ball centered at this Y bar, and look at the cylinder that projects down to that ball, and look at this set, okay, here. And for every point in the sequence, consider this set here. Now, the limit belongs to the projection if and only if these sets here have a non-empty intersection. So, so that's how you relate closedness of intersections, uh, uh, non-emptiness of intersections, to proving closedness of projections of closed sets. So now here's how the analysis goes. We prove a few theorems uh, on non-emptiness of intersection of a nested family of closed sets. Now these theorems generalize the the fundamental result about compactness. You have a nested sequence of compact sets, which is not, and sets are non-empty, then the intersection is non-empty. So what we need here, however, is something that, as a substitute, a relaxation of the compactness property. And what we use for this is, are these directions of unboundedness, directions of recession in connection with various properties of the sets, like polyhedral character, whether they are conic sections, whether they are, uh, they, uh, whether they involve, uh, they have an unempty lineality space, they extend their directions of recession, extend in both directions, and so on. So all of this involves here directions of recession, polyhedral character, quadratic character, or sets that result from quadratic functions, positive definite quadratic functions, and so on. Now, we prove three or four theorems of this type, and each one of those theorems gives you a no-duality gap result for convex programming, an existence result, existence of a minimum of f over x, and a result involving inf sup, showing inf sup equals sup inf, and existence of a saddle point. 
And this generalized classical results involving compactness. Now, not all of this is new. There are scattered results of this type in the literature, but I think that this is the first time that all of this is brought together and done systematically. Just as an example, um, consider problems involving quadratic functions, such as minimize f of x subject to g j sub x less or equal to zero, and, uh, and f and g j are semi-definite quadratic. So they are convex. Now, it's possible to show some results about non-emptiness of intersection of sets defined by quadratic inequalities. And out of this, prove a result about the existence of a solution of this problem, and also about the existence of a duality gap for this problem. It's the same theorem that works in both cases. And now, this type of theorem applies to linear programming for the case where f and g are linear, to quadratic programming, when these are linear and this is, uh, this is quadratic, and to some case of semi-definite programming where all of those, or some or all of those, are quadratic. There are some similar results about cases of polyhedral constraints and so on. Okay, now I want to go to the third uh, topic, which has to do with Lagrange multiplier theory and the notion of pseudonormality. Now we change gear a little bit here because we are not restricting ourselves to convex problems. This applies to non-convex problems, although some of the tools of convex analysis and non-smooth analysis come into play. In particular, we assume that the problem is non-convex, but we also assume, but we assume smoothness, okay? We assume differentiability, continuous differentiability everywhere. And the problem is to minimize f, and I'm going to restrict myself to quality constraints. Everything goes through for inequality constraints as well. But notice that there's an extra set constraint here, an abstract set constraint, and I impose no assumptions whatsoever on capital X. It can be as weird as you want. Now, the classical necessary condition for this type of problem, for the case where X is Rn, is that under some conditions, some constraint qualification, there exists some scale as lambda i, a Lagrange multiplier vector, such that the gradient of the Lagrangian is equal to zero. And the basic analytical issue for this problem is what is the fundamental structure of the constraint set that guarantees the existence of these Lagrange multipliers. That's where the basic, the basic analytical theory revolves around. And there are some standard constraint qualifications for the case where x is equal to Rn, they are of course very well known, they go way back. For the case where x is a subset of Rn, it's more complicated, and it's only recently been addressed. But let me restrict myself to the case where x equals to Rn for the moment. And the standard conditions under which there exists a Lagrange multiplier vector are two. The first is that the gradients of the constraint are linearly independent, or alternatively, that the functions h are linear. And uh, in both cases, there does exist a Lagrange multiplier vector. Now, there are many ways of proving these and extended versions for inequality constraints. And the classical theorem is the Fritz John theorem that says if you have an optimal solution, a locally optimal solution, there exists a multiplier, a non negative multiplier mu zero, and some lambdas, not all of them simultaneously zero such that this Lagrangian-like, the gradient of this Lagrangian-like function is zero. If mu zero e were equal to, to one, it was not there, then you would have the gradient of Lagrangian equal to zero. The problem here is that mu zero can be zero, but what the fritz john theorem says is that there always exists, regardless of constraint qualification, a mu zero and lambda, such that this is true. Now, under the, if the gradients are linearly independent, then immediately it follows that there exists a Lagrange multiplier vector because mu zero cannot be zero. If it were zero, you would have linear dependence of the gradients, which is forbidden by the constraint qualification. 
So this result, the classical Fritz-John result, guarantees that the linear independence constraint qualification is valid and guarantees existence of a Lagrange multiplier. On the other hand, this theorem does, cannot prove the other constraint qualification, the, uh, the, the linearity of the constraints. And it turns out that it's possible to enhance the Fritz-John conditions, make them more powerful, more discriminating, and so that they guarantee, they, they prove the, cons the linearity constraint qualification. And this is the following. It says, not only there exists mu zero and lambda i such that this is true, but in addition, there exists a sequence converging to the local minimum such that it is possible to improve the cost along that sequence while violating the constraints consistently with the sign of the Lagrange multipliers. Not all mu's and lambda satisfying this satisfy the second condition. It's only a subset that satisfies this condition. And with this condition, you can prove that the linearity constraint qualification is valid. So basically, this fritz John conditions is the union of these two constraint qualifications for the, for the equality constraint case. For the inequality constraint case, it's a little bit more complicated, and, that's, and so is the case when you have a x less than the, a subset of Rn. Now, one interesting thing here is that if you can show that mu is positive, by normalization you can take it equal to 1, so it will not be there, and you have the existence of Lagrange multipliers, but these Lagrange multipliers are special. They have a sensitivity property. In particular, they indicate which constraints you should be violating and on what side in order to improve the cost function. So under very minimal assumptions, you get some elementary sensitivity information that not all Lagrange multipliers have. So now, this Fritz-John theorem motivates a general constraint qualification. And that's pseudonormality. We say that a feasible point x star is pseudonormal. If one cannot find lambdas that make the constraints that form uh, uh, non-trivial linear combination constraints, e constraint gradients equal to zero, and simultaneously find an xk sequence converging to x star, such that this is true here. Now, one immediate consequence of this definition is that if you have a pseudonormal local minimum, then in the Fritz-John theorem, you can take mu zero equal to one, and as a result, you have an exist existence of this special type of Lagrange multiplier, which we call informative. Pseudonormality can be interpreted geometrically. Uh, a point is pseudonormal under two circumstances. Either the constraint gradients are linearly independent, in which case this is violated, and you cannot find such a set of lambdas, or the constraint gradients are linearly dependent, and then consider a mapping of a ball around x star, consider the constraint in constraint space, the mapping of the constraint function of this ball. Now, if this map, if this maps onto a linear set, then you have pseudonormality. If, on the other hand, this maps into a set that extends on one side, it's not a linear set, then pseudonormality is violated. If you have linear independence of the constraints, this condition here comes into play. If you have linearity of the constraints, then this condition comes into play and guarantees existence of a Lagrange multiplier. There's a similar figure for inequality constraints, and in that case, this set ought to be on one side of this hyperplane defined by some lambda here. Let me get back to this informative Lagrange multipliers. Once you have pseudonormality, then the enhanced fritz john conditions guarantee existence of Lagrange multipliers, and they have a special sensitivity property. They indicate the constraints to violate in order to improve the cost. And we call this informative Lagrange multipliers. 
And there's a nice result here. If there exists at least one Lagrange multiplier vector, there exists one that's informative. So if there's a unique Lagrange multiplier vector, necessarily it's informative. If there are many Lagrange multiplier vectors, there's always a subset, all but at least one, that is informative. So they're always there. And as I said, they provide sensitivity information. So now let me briefly go into the extension of this fritz john conditions for the case where you have an additional constraint set. So the problem is minimize f of x subject to inequality constraints and this extra set constraint. Then the optimality condition about the Lagrangian becomes the following. that the gradient of the Lagrangian is not necessarily zero, but it belongs to something called the normal cone at x star. OK, this is a concept from non-smooth analysis. If you have a set x, let's say, like that, you have a certain point, then the tangent cone is defined as the, the set of all directions such that asymptotically along, along those directions you stay within the set. So this is called the set of tangents. That's denoted by t, so x at a given point. Now, there are polar directions to this, to this tangent cone, which are the directions that make an angle greater or equal to 90 degrees with these tangent directions. Now, if you consider limits of polar directions at points at sequences of points that converge to x star, you get so-called normal directions. And under anomalous circumstances, there may be more normal directions than there are polar directions. In other words, this normal cone may contain strictly this polar cone. That's a fundamental concept. And we, call, and we say that capital X is regular at x star if the normal cone is equal to the polar cone, the polar of its tangent cone at x star. It turns out that if x is convex, then this is always true. But there are situations where it's not true. And it turns out that if you have a set, if you have a local minimum which is not regular, where the constraint set is not regular, the entire Lagrange multiplier theory breaks down. In other words, you still get this condition, but that condition is now meaningless. And it is meaningless because this Lagrangian may have negative slope along some tangent directions, some feasible directions of the constraint set, which makes it, which, in which case, Lagrange multipliers lose their fundamental property, namely that they make the Lagrangian function stationary along all feasible directions. So regularity is a fault line beyond which there is no satisfactory Lagrange multiplier theory. Otherwise, all the conditions, including pseudo-normality that I gave earlier, go through in a satisfactory form. So here's an outline of how this theory breaks down. In the case where x is equal to Rn, the classical case where there's no abstract constraint set, we have various constraint qualifications. The independent constraint gradients, constraint qualification, linear constraints, and for inequality constraints, the so-called Mangasari and Fromovich constraint qualification, a very basic constraint qualification. All of this implies pseudo-normality, which in turn implies the existence of Lagrange multipliers, which is equivalent to existence of informative Lagrange multipliers. The classical theory takes each one of these constraint qualifications and proves directly and separately for each one the existence of Lagrange multipliers. What we do here is we prove two theorems. One is the fritz john conditions, the enhanced fritz john conditions, which guarantee that pseudo-normality guarantees existence. And the other is to show that each one of these constraint qualifications guarantees pseudo-normality. And this is not difficult. It's a couple of pages of proof. And the overall analysis is simplified a great deal this way. Let's continue now the more general case where x is not strict, strict subset of Rn, but regular, like for example, it's a convex set. 
then again, pseudo-normality serves as a bridge between constraint qualifications and the existence of Lagrange multipliers. There's a mangasite in front of its like condition, generalized for the case where x is different than uh, n. There's also the cla classical slider condition, some other conditions of, of similar character. They all imply pseudo-normality, which in turn implies through the Fritz-John theorem, existence of Lagrange multipliers, and this is equivalent again to the existence of informative Lagrange multipliers. If capital X is not regular, there's a similar diagram, but these are not Lagrange multipliers that you get. They're something that's kind of strange and doesn't, it's not very helpful. So let me close by just mentioning a few extensions of all this. Uh, the fritz john theory has been extended to the case where there doesn't necessarily exist a primal optimal solution, but instead convexity is assumed. Um, there is a connection between pseudo-normality and exact penalty functions. Uh, this constraint qualification guarantees pseudo-normality. Pseudo-normality in turn guarantees the existence that, that, that it's possible to construct exact penalty functions. I'm not going to get into this. I hope, I hope that uh, many of you can uh, have heard of this exact penalty functions before. Finally, there is a connection between the notion of shin normality and a classical unifying concept in Lagrange multiplier theory called quasi-regularity. Quasi-regularity for the case of x equals to our n means that the tangent cone is equal to the cone of first order feasible variations. Now, this concept of quasi-regularity works fine for the case where x is equal to Rn, but it turns out that it breaks down in the case where x is strict, a strict subset of Rn, so the classical line of analysis simply does not go through in terms of unification. What you assume normally does go through. So I guess I've reached my limit, and uh, I thank you very much. And uh, I'm sorry if this has been too broad and not very mathematical, but like I said, all, there's a lot of material on the web on all this, and you can find it there. We have time for one question. Thank you very much, Dimitri.